Time is a uh, very challenging time for everyone. Actually, my wife fall asleep as well, so I ask for your <laughs> pardon this early. Uh, uh, thank you, Brother Jojo, for the introduction. Actually, I'm, we've been here in Malaysia for almost 13 years now. When I started, I moved here in Malaysia when my eldest, Juan Carlos, was just uh, three months old, I think. And that's how I remember how old we are in Malaysia, because he's now 13, so we're 13 years here already. Uh, but we're still Filipino, very much Filipino. I don't mean Okanwar and other basic Malay words, no? so I cannot converse very well in, uh, in Bahasa. Uh, three kids, so one Carlos is my eldest, one Emmanuel is the second, and the youngest is somewhere outside. Uh, Isabel, Missy, four years old, pregnant five next month. And my wife is behind me. Uh, that's my left. <laughs> so, yeah, Brother Jojo, uh, I introduced my talk, but before I start, let me just play this small slideshow. Christian very much starts with Christ. No? If you take away Christ, as what Brother Jonas mentioned last uh, last week, you are left with I am, which means I am nothing. Which means that Christ is the center of Christianity. Christ is essential. We cannot take away Christ, otherwise we cease to become Christians. So in the next couple of minutes, we'll just try to, uh, I'll just try to give out some ideas on what Christianity means. But before I do that, I'll start off with this, so what Christianity is not. So let's discuss what Christianity is not before we try to understand what Christianity is. So the first point in there is it's not a mere religious system. So. Christianity doesn't mean just following a set of religious doctrines. No? It doesn't mean just going to Sunday Mass. It doesn't mean just saying the Novena or the prayers that we know of and stopping there. Doing that is part of Christianity, is part of our Catholic faith, but that by itself doesn't, doesn't embody the whole of Christianity. When I was young, and when most of us were young, when, when our parents want us to you know, go to Sunday school or study the Bible, we always say, no, I, I, I go to Mass anyway on Sunday, even, even now. But when we ask people to go on these seminars, the majority of them will always say, no, I already go to Sunday Mass, I perform my church duties. But that is not sufficient. That is not Christianity by itself. It must translate, the faith must translate and permeate our lives. So it must be seen in the way we live. So it's not just following those set of doctrines. It's not just, it's not, it's not just following those set of practices. It's also not a mere moral system. It's not just a set of rules, what you can and what you cannot do. That makes it mechanical. 
everybody can do that. Give a person a list of what he does and what he doesn't, he can follow that. But that doesn't make that person a Christian. That doesn't complete. That is not the embodiment of our Christian faith. Okay, so it's not just a religious system. It's not a mere moral system. It's also not only a social or humanitarian system. What does that mean? No? I took the example of the Good Samaritan. Okay, the Good Samaritan is a good social example of what we should do to other people. But that by itself, this set of humanitarian or social values doesn't make us a complete Christian. Other denominations, other faiths also does that. There was even a discussion before, look, before Christianity, you know, there are other group of people who actually do good, even now, you know, non-Christians, we've got friends who are not Catholics, who are not Christians, but they treat you know, their neighbors well, they're good neighbors, they have a good set of moral values, but we as Christians should go beyond that. You know? So it's not just social humanitarian, it's not just being a good Samaritan. The difference is, of course, we have Jesus as part of our faith, as part of our Christian faith. And we have, therefore, a claim to his promise of eternal life. So it's not just being a good neighbor, it's not, not just being socially responsible. And the last one is, it's not an escape from realities of life. I've heard a lot of these things being mentioned, you know, that, you know, especially in the Philippines. So why is the Philippines the same? Why is the Philippines so poor? Why are a lot of the Catholic nations so poor? They will say it's because of it's because of our faith. It's because we are satisfied with being poor. And we accept that. So it's not an escape from realities of life. We know we're poor. It's not an opium for the poor. It's not for the weak who cannot face the challenges of life. The difference is we're poor, but we should still strive to get the best out of our life. It is not about just blind faith, staying put with what you have and not doing anything about it. God doesn't want us to suffer. God wants us to prosper. God wants us to make the most of what He has given us, of the talents, of the resources that He has given us. Given us. So it's not an escape from the realities of life. It's facing the realities of life with all the talents and resources that God has given us. There was this story of this person who got trapped because of a big storm. So the flood was coming, the flood was quickly rising, and he had to go up to the roof of his house. He was a man of faith. He was saying, no, I trust God. I know God will save me. Therefore, he stayed at the roof of the house, and he was praying. And then a rescue boat came by and asked him, come on, brother, up into the boat. Now the flood is rising up. We have to rescue you. No, 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 don't bother me. I'm praying, praying to my Lord. I know my Lord will give me a miracle and will save me. So the boat moved on, moved on to rescue the other people. Five minutes came by, another rescue boat came and asked him the same thing. Come on, brother, hop into the boat. The flood is rising. Before you get drowned, come in. We, we are here to rescue you. He kept on praying, no, 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 don't bother me. I'm praying to my Lord. I have faith in my Lord. He will save me. He will give me a miracle. Ten minutes after, the floods rose and he drowned. So our faith is not blind faith. It's not an escape from the realities of life. Challenges will be there. God will give us the opportunities. That we should take it. We should act on it. In the case of the person, God was already sending him his miracle. God was already sending him his Savior. But he wasn't listening. So Christianity doesn't mean staying put. You know? And if we are poor, if we are, if we are suffering, just sitting down and accepting our suffering. Christianity means acting on it, using all the resources 
using all the tools, the talents that God has given to us because that's what God wants us to do. Okay. So what is Christianity? <clears throat> the essence of Christianity is our union with God made possible through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So its essence is the union with God. That means it's a relationship with God. It's not just a set of rules, it's not an arm's length relationship, it's a union, meaning we should be close to our God. That is Christianity. And it was made possible through the death and resurrection, and therefore it's based on love, it's based on sacrifice. It's also made possible through the death and resurrection. So we, our Lord God, Jesus Christ, didn't just die, but He was resurrected. Meaning, it is current. He is a living God. It is current and valid today as it was 2,000 years ago. So ours is not like the other religions whose leaders have died and have remained dead. Ours is a faith where our God sacrificed his life for us and is resurrected and is therefore a living God. So, what is Christianity? No, as per the previous slide, it's a relationship initiated by God, which makes it unique you know, and special. Because normally, the one who will initiate the relationship will be the lesser party, you know, not the person in higher authority. Uh, who here are couples or boyfriends, girlfriends, are in a relationship? We have one there behind. Two, three, four, five. Okay. Who made the first move? Was it the girl? Or the guy? In the face of our brother and sister there, it's Sister Giselle. <laughs> so the one who makes, who initiates the relationship, who makes the first move, is normally the person in a position of lower power. No? In the case of a relationship, normally before before you get married, it's the ladies who hold that higher ground. No? They will say yes, or they will say no. So the one who approaches normally is the man. Right? In the case of our faith, no, it's the other way around. No? It's the Lord, it's our God who actually initiated the relationship. So in that sense, it's unique, you know, it's special. In the Philippines, uh, if a lovely lady comes to you, of course, well, what will you do? No, as they say in the Philippines, you know, for those who don't speak Tagalog, you will know, get someone to translate it. So definitely, so it's, this, this is the case. So I, uh, how do you translate that? Anybody who's good? <laughs> so if the rice grain is the one who's coming to the chicken, you would expect the chicken, of course, to just grab the rice grain. Right? It doesn't need to make any effort. It's the same with our faith. No, that is Christianity. The relationship was initiated by God. Food is already coming to us. It will be foolish for us not to accept that. So in Ephesians 2, verses 4 to 8. So I'll just read that. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of the great love He has for us, even when we were dead with our transgressions, brought us to life with Christ. By grace we have been saved. Raised us up with Him and seated us with Him in the heavens in Christ Jesus. 
that in the ages to come, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from you, it is the gift of God. So, God was the one who initiated the relationship, who was given this gift of faith, who was given the gift of salvation. Okay. So second, it results to a new creation. We participate in the very life of Christ. This can be read in Galatians chapter 2, verses 20 and 4, 4 to 7. So it says, Yet I live, no longer I, but Christ lives in me. In so far as I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who has loved me and given his, himself up for me. And then in Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 to 7, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to ransom those under the law, so that we might receive adoption. As proof that you are children, God sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a child. And if a child, then also an heir through God. So we become the sons of the Father as well. And we participate in the very life of Christ. So it means that, you know, we, Christ has shown us an example of how God's Son is, and what a Christian should be. And we should follow the example that Christ has given us, which is based on love for God and love for our neighbors. And the third point of what Christianity is, is we take on the nature of God, which is holiness. So there has to be a change. Once we accept our faith, there has to be a change. And that is why, as I mentioned earlier, Christianity is not just a set of do's and don'ts. It's not just following set routines or set doctrines. It is more than that. There has to be a change in us. That is key. So in Colossians chapter 3, verses 5 to 10, put to death then the part of you that are earthly, immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and the greed that is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming upon the disobedient. By these, you too once conducted yourselves when you lived in that way. But now you must put them all away. Anger, fury, malice, slander, and obscene language out of your mouths. Stop lying to one another, since you have taken off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed for knowledge in the image of its creator. So once we accept the faith, we throw away our old self and put on our new self, following the example of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Okay, so again, it's a relationship initiated by God. It's not by us. It's a gift from Him. It's a grace coming from Him. We accept it, and when we accept that faith, we become Christians, and that should result to a new creation. We participate in the Christian life and take on the nature of God, and we become holy. And that is something that should be seen inside and outside of us. So what does this all mean? Being Christians mean that we have 
our that relationship with God. And God is our Father. So if we have God as our Father, that means, and we know that God is an all-powerful God, then that means we should trust Him. It's pointless to call Him our Father if we don't trust Him. How many of you don't trust your humanly fathers? I don't see any hands. Oh, my son is going to raise his hand. <laughs> so if nobody distrusts their humanly, their biological fathers, and us, your biological fathers, us have got our own physical and human limits, then what more of our God the Father, who is all-powerful, who is all-knowing, who loves us so much? If we, deep in our hearts, believe that, then there shouldn't be any reason why we would not trust Him. The last we, Brother June, gave the story of uh, the people who were jumping off the plane, right? The Buddha story, right? So that is not trust, no? Do we really trust him? We're lucky that at this time and age, martyrdom is not in fashion. Unlike before, where people will have to you know, show and demonstrate their faith and to die for their faith and have to be martyred for their faith. Now, we are not asked to do that. But that doesn't mean that we should not show our trust and our faith in God. So if we indeed believe that God is our Father, then we should trust Him. Trust Him that He knows our needs and He will provide for us. So we pray to Him. We know that if we pray to Him, that He will listen to us. But, again, the problem is, what we think is that when we pray and ask Him something, He will always give it to us. Our humanly Father doesn't do that as well, right? And we know that God knows what's good for us. So when we pray, we ask for the things that we need, but that doesn't mean that we will get that. We will get it if it's good for us and in His time. If we don't get it, that doesn't mean that God doesn't listen to us. If we don't get it, that means the answer is no. And that is the problem. Sometimes it's difficult for us to accept that, that God says no. But yes, God says no if it's not going to be good for us. So trust in Him, have faith in Him, pray to Him. He knows our needs, He will provide for us. And the third point is, we have a relationship with the same God, with the same Father, and therefore, we are part of the same family. And that makes us, therefore, brothers and sisters. So when we call each other brother, when we call each other sister, it's not just literal. It means that in our faith, we are brothers and sisters, and therefore, we should share and care for one another. And that's where community becomes important. And that's where we nurture that relationship. That's where we share activities together as one family, and praising our common Father in heaven. Okay. The second point is that our life here on earth is temporary. So we should question ourselves. Where should we invest our time and our effort? Should we invest it in building, building riches here on earth where it is our temporary home, our transient home, and not provide for our permanent residence in heaven? Where should we invest our time, our effort, our resources? It is foolish to think that we will carry what we have here on earth once we pass on. Our faith is a faith that doesn't believe in 
reincarnation. No? It's not like the other faiths wherein uh, I'll try to live my life here. If I don't do well, then I get reincarnated as another person or as another animal. And then I try to do it and perfect myself. No? I have multiple chances, no brothers and sisters. We don't believe in that. Christians, we die. We either go up or go down. Uh, there's something in the middle as well. But you only get one chance. So don't waste that chance. Invest in having a wonderful life with our Father in heaven. That doesn't mean that you should not get rich or you should not enjoy your life here. As I mentioned, no? our faith is not being miserable. It's not about being miserable. It's about knowing where your priorities are. Invest the right time and the right resources towards making sure that you enjoy life with the Father after you have passed on. And knowing those two points about what should it give us? If we believe in all of those points, then there shouldn't be any reason for us not to be at peace. If we know that we have God as our Father, a loving God, an all-powerful God, who knows our needs and provides for our needs and provides what's good for us, and we know that we have brothers and sisters in the faith who cares for us, then why should we not be at peace? We should ask ourselves that question. If we indeed believe those points, why should we worry? Why should we be not at peace? So as Christians, we should be at peace because we are assured that God is our Father. We have brothers and sisters to care and love for us as well. Okay, this is the last slide I have. So just three points I would like to leave you before I finish off. Having God himself as our Father, we are most fortunate and privileged people. So we should feel special. We should not feel ashamed. We should not be proud. We should not feel unproud of our faith, rather. God himself is our Father. We should feel fortunate and privileged. And that leads to the last point. We should rejoice and experience, therefore, peace in our lives and in our families. But these are all, you know, just saying, okay, we're Christians, but what do we do? We cannot just say, okay, now I'm Christian, I've accepted that, and therefore I should be at peace. No, it's, it's, it's not a miracle. It's not something that you just switch on and then everything will happen and fall into place. And that's where the second point is. No? We know we have been given this faith. We are privileged. Because that makes us part of the Christian family. We should therefore rejoice and experience peace in our lives. But to fully realize the Christian faith, we should work on becoming a better Christian. And what do we need to do to become better Christians? Then that's what the rest of these, how many more weeks? Six weeks, basically will give us. You know? The subsequent talks, starting with the first, the next one after this, on repentance and faith, will give us the recipe, these things that we have to work on to be sure that we become better Christian and therefore have a better realization of the privilege that we enjoy being God's children. Hopefully that will lead to us being at ease, at peace. Therefore, we can rejoice in the presence of the Lord, knowing you know, that our faith makes us special in the eyes of God. Uh, yep, I guess that's it. So thank you very much.